Hey, everybody, it's Kathy Randall from Synapse Care Solutions. Welcome back to another presentation of our Caring During Cooling replay. I'm really excited um, to have you with us again and to bring you another presentation that I know you are going to truly enjoy. And that will really be food for thought, no pun intended for what you can do in your unit to improve the care that we provide for babies during cooling. I just want to give my warm thanks and gratitude to Dr. Wissam Albaraki, who is our guest faculty for this presentation. And click on the QR code or scan the QR code on your screen right now using your device, and you'll be able to download the slides to follow along with this. I will put the link at the end and in the show notes here on YouTube for you. So don't worry if you um, missed them and you would like to have the slides to follow along. So again, without further ado, many thanks to Dr. Albaraki for being with us, and I will see you again at the end. It looks like you guys are joining. Oh my gosh, I'm really excited about today's presentation. I know all of you are as well. I can see you joining, and I knew this was going to be another very popular conversation because this is something that in the control trials, we didn't feed babies. And so many of us are just continuing through to offer those same practices. And so it's nice to see so many of you interested in evolving that practice as we, we move forward. So as people are joining, I just wanted to run through a few introductory slides. And my name is Kathy Randall, if we've not met before. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner by by training and trade, but I um, created Synapse Care Solutions to provide NICU clinicians around the globe education, connection, and inspiration. And so this idea came from our conference that we used to do in person, and it was called the One Conference. And the idea of the One Conference is that there is so much power in just one person and that each of you have the opportunity with the education you get through our community of connection and hopefully some inspiration that you will feel like you as one person can make a difference in your unit, make a difference in our profession, whatever profession you're in. And also you can make a difference in one baby's life. You can make a difference in one moment, one touch with one thing you do we make a difference. And that I think sometimes we forget with all the chaos and all the complexity of the care we provide, it's sometimes easy to forget that. So the idea of being the one is really important to me, but I hope that you embrace that and embody that yourself wherever you go from today with this education, what are you going to do with this information? It's not enough to just come and to just learn, but what will you do? There's so much we can do with this information, but what will you, that one person do in your unit? So I really just wanted to just remind you of that. So as I've been saying, this is part of our series, but also we have more than just these series. We have courses as well. I'm so excited that we're going to be focusing specifically on on this practice of feeding, which we know is so important, but we have AEG courses, we have a certification prep, and we have small baby. So if you've not linked in with us on that, so just to let you know, we have all these other things, but I am really excited to be presenting our guest today. And it's Dr. Wissam Albaraki, and he is a neonatologist, and he is going to share with you some of the best practices around caring during cooling and feeding during cooling. And I'll let him give a little introduction. I met him through another friend and colleague and, and he's moved on from Calgary over to Nova Scotia now and is a clinician there. But Dr. Albaraki, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your publication. I know people are gonna be really excited to hear everything you have to share today. Thank you very much, Kathy, for the introduction. And hello everyone and wherever you are, and let's have fun together. Thank you very much again for inviting me to speak about this subject. So my interest is gastrointestinal disease and feeding and nutrition in newborn and especially preterm babies. So today we'll be focusing on our second brain. And I call it the second brain because the intestinal nervous system consists of 200 to 600 million neurons. So to feed or not to feed during cooling is the subject of our presentation today. This is the outline of my presentation. 
I will start with an introduction where we can speak a little bit about the gut and the gut-brain axis and the therapeutic hypothermia and feeding. Then I will speak a little bit about the variation in practice between centers. And here I will ask you a question about your practice in your centers. Then I will summarize the results of the studies related to the topic of feeding during therapeutic hypothermia and present our recently published study. So to start with, anatomical differentiation of the human intestines usually occurs within the 20 gestation week. The functional maturation requires two things. The organized movement, which happen usually at 29 to 30 weeks of gestation, and the coordinated sucking and swallowing that will happen a little bit later at 32 and 34 weeks of gestation. The size of intestine increases drastically between week five and 40, around thousand times, it's huge. And the intestines represent a very big interface between our internal and external environment. So to know approximately the surface area of uh, an adult intestine, it's the same surface of a tennis court. The function of intestinal tract is not only digestion and absorption, it's also neural, endocrine, and exocrine, and immunologic, like we are going to see in the next few slides. So this cartoon is representing the developmental phases of the digestive function and the gut innervation and motility. When we are speaking about HIE or cool babies, we are speaking about this population. So 35 weeks and above. And anatomically, this population, they have anatomically developed and functionally mature intestine tract. But having said that, the GI tract will, like the brain and other organs, be impacted by the hypoxic ischemic event too. And after birth, the brain development continues in volume and neural function, but the same happen in the gut. So their development is interdependent and mediated through what we call the gut-brain axis. And if we read recent literature, we can hear the terminology of microbiota, gut-brain axis. So we have three things, the brain, the intestines, and the microbiota inside. And this communication is not only from the brain to the intestine, it's bi-directional between the gut and the brain. And it seems that the gut and the brain are constantly talking to each other. We don't have a deep knowledge of this language and we are just decrypting a few letters of this complex language. But speaking about gut and brain, my gut feeling is that the future researchers will bring more comprehension to our brains of this complex relation and connection between them. So let me give you a few examples of this mechanism. So this mechanism include neural, so the central nervous system, the enteral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, which is the sympathetic and parasympathetic represented by the vagal nerve. And the autonomic nervous system is known to be connected centrally to the limbic system. But also we have endocrine, immune, metabolic mediators. So the brain will send signals to modulate the GI function. But at the same time, the intestines will produce molecules that will influence the brain. So I will just mention three or four examples for simplification. We all know that the breakdown of the protein in the intestines will give amino acids. And without those four amino acids coming from the intestines, the brain wouldn't be able to function and have its neurotransmitters, serotonin, GABA, dopamine, norepinephrine, and histamine. So this is a very important relation between the gut and the brain. Another example is the bacteria we have in the gut. So the microbiota. In the wall of those bacteria, we have what we call the bacterial peptidoglycans. So it's part of the wall. They can separate from the bacteria 
and those parts have an immune signaling function. So it can bind to the vagal nerve, or it can go with the blood reaching the brain and exert a direct effect on the function and development of the developing brain. So this is a direct connection between the microbiota and the brain and how it can affect it. Another example is what we call the enteroendocrine cells, the EECs. Those cells produce hormones like ghrelin or the well-known glucagon type 1, which has a neuroprotective effect on the brain. And the last example I want to mention is about microglia. So microglia are cells that are resident immune cells in the brain. So they have an immune function in the brain. But it appears that their maturation and function is related to the changes in the gut microbiota and influenced by the short chain fatty acids. Those short fatty chain fatty acids are produced by the fermentation of dietary fibers in our intestines because we cannot digest fibers. So here again, the effect of microbiota on maturation of brain cells and immunity. So this is only a summary. It's more complex than this, but I wanted only to give you an idea of this relation and connection in the gut brain. So enough of molecular talk now. So let's speak about other ideas related to feed and therapeutic hypothermia. So therapeutic hypothermia is the standard treatment for infants with moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, as we know. And uh, neck, which is rare in this population, may be due to the hypoxic ischemic event or to the cooling itself that can affect the blood perfusion to the gut. But on the other hand, therapeutic hypothermia may reduce inflammation and therefore protect against neck. So these concerns led to the common practice of keeping infants NPO during cooling and providing IV fluid or TPN. But reaching full enteral feeding is an important target that impacts length of stay in cool infants. And breast milk has beneficial attributes for gut compromised infants. So the question here, should we feed or not infants during therapeutic hypothermia? And before going to the studies and details, I would like to know your opinion and what is your practice in your center? So to only to have an idea. So do you feed babies during cooling or not? So we'll give you 30 seconds to answer this question and we can see and display the result after this. So we'll give you guys a few more seconds, but the results so far coming in are mostly nurses and then about 10% therapists and about 10% physicians, but about 60% nurses and then 17% other. And about 7% right now are saying that they have a protocol, so they're always doing it. And then 20% or 15 to 20% are considering a protocol. Oh my gosh, are you seeing in the chat where everyone is from? Taiwan and Panama, Arizona, Israel, New York, Ukraine, Massachusetts, Australia. So truly international today. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we can understand that we have international audience. So we have approximately 42% sometimes, and always is 7%, no feeding 35%. Okay, great. So what does this say is that we have variation in practice. This is not only in Canada. I'm going to show you now this study that was recently published from the Canadian Neonatal Network, speaking about the same subject, which is the variation in practice and outcome of HIE babies who were cooled in tertiary in ICUs in Canada. So here in Canada, we have 24 tertiary care NICU where we can cool babies. So this article was published and despite having focused on the brain injury and mortality, but because I am focused on GI, I wanted to see also the variation in practice in feeding those babies. So this was a study conducted, like I said, by the Canadian network, neonatal network, over 
11 years, so 2010 to 2020, and they had around 3,000 patients. So let me show you what they found about the initiation of feeding. So initiation of feeds in the first two days of therapeutic hypothermia ranged between 8% and 42% among the different sites in, in Canada. And this variation is there, and I'm expecting similar findings elsewhere also around the globe. So we can say in general, from those 3,000 patients that less than a third were started on feeding during therapeutic hypothermia. So now let's mention a little bit about the few studies related to feeding during cooling. The first one was a comparison between two cohorts, the Swedish one where they were feeding the babies and UK where they were keeping the babies in PO. And they have 50 babies in each group. And what they found is that they have a higher rate of full enteral feeding at discharge in the fed group. And their conclusion was that enteral feeding was well tolerated and did not increase adverse outcomes compared with NPO or TPN. And the other study from Chang et al, they have 17 patients in each group and they were starting the fed group at around 20 ml per kg per day as trophic feed. And what they found is that they have less days of TPN and they reached full enteral feeding earlier in the fed group. And another important finding was that the enterally fed group had less inflammatory markers and less length of stay compared with withholding feeds. So this was the summary of the, those two studies. But as I said, our fear to feed the cool babies is from neck. But to justify this fear, we need to know the rate of neck in this population. And of course, this requires a, a big number of patients to be observed. So is this available in the literature? Fortunately, yes. And Gerlita conducted a study about feeding during therapeutic hypothermia. And they have an answer to this question for us. So they aim to assess the association between feeding during therapeutic hypothermia and important clinical outcomes. And I think this is the biggest population-based retrospective cohort study. They took their data from the neonatal network in UK between 2010 and 2017. And their primary outcome was severe neck. The secondary outcomes were late onset infection, survival to discharge, length of stay, and breast milk at discharge. So let's have a look at during that period, they have around 6,000 babies who were cooled. But worth mentioning here that their criteria for cooling at that time in the UK was more than 36 weeks gestational age. And what we can see here is that less than a third of those patients were fed during cooling. And the important number we have to remember is that only 0.1% of those cool babies developed severe neck. What they have done also is from this big cohort, they created two matched groups. And this is to have comparable baseline characteristics between the two groups. So 1,600 approximately in each group. And what they found is that they have less than five cases in each group. But the fed group had less late onset infection and more survival at discharge and more breastfeeding rate at discharge and less length of stay in the hospital. In this study, there was an absence of data on HIE severity indicators. This may have confounded the association between enteral feeding and favorable clinical outcomes. And the other thing is that the feeding was reported as dichotomous outcome. So you have feeding, non-feeding, we don't have any information about the volume or the progression of the feed. So now in the next few slides, I will speak about our study that was published in the Journal of Maternal Fetal and Neonatal Medicine uh, about feeding during therapeutic hypothermia. Before 2016, our practice in Calgary, or Alberta, was to keep cool babies NPO during cooling. But after this, we started to feed them fresh mother's milk when available, and having in mind that we may benefit from the stem cells so 
our study design, this was a prospective cohort with historical control. We included all babies who qualified for cooling at 35 weeks or above, who were admitted at Alberta Children's Hospital, level three NICU in Calgary, between January 2013 and December 2018. During this period, we had 146 babies cooled. The first group was the FanFed group, 75 patients. And this was the first epoch between January 2013 and May 2016. So this group was kept NPO during the 72 hours of therapeutic hypothermia, then was fed and increased gradually to reach full enteral feeding. The TFI during cooling was kept at 50 ml per kg per day. The fed group, 71 patients, which represents the second epoch between September 2016 and December 2018, was fed at 10 ml per kg per day of human milk during therapeutic hypothermia. Then we increased the feed gradually to reach the full feeding. And the TFI also here was kept at 50 ml per kg per day during the therapeutic hypothermia. Our primary outcome was the time to reach full enteral feeding, which was defined as no IV fluid and no parenteral nutrition. Our secondary outcomes included length of stay, number of days kept NPO, the duration of IV fluid or PN in days, the rate of neck, rate of exclusive breastfeeding at discharge, and the rate of discharge home with nasogastric tube and other clinical and radiological outcomes. So let's see our results. So from table one, you can see that the maternal and neonatal baseline characteristics were comparable between the two groups. Of course, as expected, because this was our intervention, the fed group received their first feed in hours earlier than the unfed group. But the unfed group had a higher percentage of high potential needing inotropic support, 47% versus 20%, and this difference was significant. So coming to our outcomes and our primary outcome, the fed group reached full enteral feeding significantly earlier with a median of six days compared with eight days in the unfed group. And the fed group has a higher rate of being fully fed in the first week with 70% compared with 53% in the unfed group. The fed group was kept NPO for a shorter period with two days in the fed group compared with four days in the unfed group. And the fed group had a higher rate of being discharged on breast milk 41% compared with 13% only in the unfed group. And we can notice that we didn't have any cases of necrotized aerocolitis or late onset. Here also, and I think our lactation consultant did a great job here, where we can see that 96% of the babies in the fed group received exclusive human milk, which is donor human milk or mother's own milk as their first feed. And the unfed group, this percentage was 81%. So if we do an adjustment for HIE stage, APGAR at 10 minutes, the core pH being outborn and being ventilated during therapeutic hypothermia, the risk of reaching the full feeding beyond the first week of life was significantly decreased in the fed group after doing all this adjustment with a confidence interval of 1.18 to 6.25. So in conclusion, the conclusion of our study was that early feeding during therapeutic hypothermia is safe, leads to a shorter time to full enteral feeding and a higher rate of breast milk feeding at discharge. And in general, there's a growing evidence suggesting that enteral feeding during cooling is beneficial and promotes gut stimulation and feeding tolerance. So if we want to summarize the potential benefits of feeding during therapeutic hypothermia from the different studies, we can say that 
early enteral feeding will give you less time to full enteral feeding, a higher rate of breast milk feeding at discharge, a lower rate of late onset infection, a higher rate of survival at discharge, a higher rate of breastfeeding at discharge, and less length of stay in the hospital and less TPN days. So what next? So all what I presented, all the presented studies were retrospective. So there is a possibility of residual or unmeasured confounding factors. So what we really need is prospective studies that are sufficiently powered, multi-center to answer this question in a better way. And our concern also is what would be the best feeding regimen? So it's not only feeding versus no feeding. What would be the best feeding regimen if we have to feed? What is the optimum type of feeding? Donor milk, breast milk, the frequency, the volume, and the day to start enteral feeding. So stay tuned for future evidence, and we can discuss this when this is available. Thank you very much. This is the hospital, St. John Regional Hospital in New Brunswick, where I'm working currently. So Kathy, I would be more than happy to have questions and discussion with you and the group. Thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. People are just saying, think great information. So going back to your study. So I think it's really important if you'll just highlight the results page where you were talking about controlling for your, the pH and all of that. Can you just explain to those who are a little less experienced with research? Why is this so important that you controlled for those specific variables? And what does that mean when you say the confidence interval? Yeah, thank you very much, Kathy, for this question. So usually we do this in retrospective study because this is not a randomized controlled trial. So I cannot have those differences distributed between the two groups. So I cannot ignore those. For example, why I'm doing adjustment. I will say that if those babies have the same HIE stage, what would be the impact on their being fully fed in the first week of life? So I fix this and I will see the other variant. Or I want to fix, for example, the core pH. If they have all the same core pH, what would be the effect of other factors on my outcome? So this is how we can simplify what we spoke about as adjustment. And the confidence interval will give me the range of certainty. And here you can see the p-value is 0.02. This means that this is significant. So if I adjust all those, the risk of reaching full feeding beyond the first week will be less in the fed group. So feeding those babies, if I control all the other factors, will be beneficial for them. I hope this is clear. Yes. Fantastic. Does that help? I think it's so important that we take this time when we have such an experienced researcher to ask these questions because what Wissam was just describing applies to other studies that you might read, like he was saying, that are retrospective. Because one thing I wondered, and I was thinking on the previous slide before you shared the, these bullet points, was in the older cohort, many of us have seen the shift, right, to cooling a little more mild babies. But my, my brain was wondering, I wonder if the babies in that first group were sicker than the babies in the second group. And I think on the previous slide, you showed it. And so I, so when you shared this, I thought, ah, no, then we can be so confident that you controlled for these things. And so we can know that these groups are. This is, yeah, this is why Kathy running a randomized control trial will uh, help us to avoid this adjustments to be done. Yes. Uh, yes. If possible. So there's a couple questions. Is the study based mostly on esophageal or rectal temperature? So in your hospitals where you practice, how are you monitoring core temperature? So it's rectal. And it's a good question, yeah, because people may think that this may affect your probe if it is in the esophagus, yeah. Yep, great. And some people are asking practical things like, is the milk warmed or is it unwarmed? Did you have a set temperature for the milk? 
Usually the milk is used in room temperature, but you have to remember those are very small volumes. It's 10 ml per kg or 20 ml per kg. Those are very small amounts, so it wouldn't make a difference. And so you do the 10 ml per kg per day or per feed, and then how so, often? Yeah, so it's a 10 ml per kg per day, and we divide this amount every three hours. Okay, so very similar to how, and then you do the bolus, you don't do a drip continuously. Yeah, so it's not continuous, it is bolus feeding. Okay, great, and people are going to ask that. If mother's milk or donor milk is not available, Ooh, this is a good question. Do you prefer NPO or do you allow for formula? Fortunately, we didn't have to face this because we are a center where donor milk is available and we changed our protocol. And you can see that in the first epoch, we didn't have donor milk available for those babies. We were providing donor milk only for preterm and extreme preterm. Mm. But later on, this was part of our new protocol where cool baby were for donor human milk. So we didn't face this problem. If I don't EBM or express breast milk, I will have the donor available. As preference, because what the studies are showing that priming the intestines would be more beneficial than keeping them NPO. Yes, those studies were done on also adults where they, they kept NPO or they have the option of feeding those adult persons, especially when they have septic shock. And they so that if we keep the intestines NPO, you have mucosal atrophy. So perhaps on the same, I would perhaps have a tendency to feed, even if it is a small amount. So with any available nutrition. Yeah, of course, preference EBM, then donor milk, then what else is available. Yeah, excellent question. This is an interesting question, and I don't know if you've looked at it, but did, have you noticed whether or not this small volume of feeding is metabolically demanding? And have you noticed any variation in the core temp? Sorry, I didn't get the question. So, you know, when you're feeding the baby that small volume, do you notice if there's any change in the core temp or the blanket temp? It, does it ramp up the baby's metabolism? Ah, uh, so those, like I said, those are very tiny amounts. We didn't measure this, but I'm not expecting this to cause any differences. Excellent. And I think just some people are asking about if they use esophageal temp probes, could they do this? And my opinion is you're not, it's not a stomach temp probe, it's an esophageal temp probe. So if you're placing an NG into the stomach, then you should be bypassing your probe and it shouldn't affect it. What would you say with them to that? Yes, correct. Okay, so just for those of you who are wondering, so we're not oral feeding, we're usually NG feeding, right? Or do you nipple feed these babies as well? It, it depends. It, it depends because if the baby is awake and you have coordination between sucking and swallowing, why not to give them some? But like I told you, we are not familiar with the esophageal probes. Yeah. We're using the rectal one, so we shouldn't face a problem. So I think I would just warm the milk to room temp. And if, if the baby's nippling those few sucks, probably in a, in a large baby like that, it's probably gobble done. And, um, that's it. and I would agree that I don't think it's going to affect your esophageal temperature. The esophagus is going to probably warm the milk as it's cruising down and it's such a quick transit um, and that your probe will be in the esophagus, not in the stomach. So you shouldn't see that if there's any variation at all. But I agree, the Chama, you were saying refrigerated milk is at 4C. So yeah, we want it to bring it up to probably the room temperature. Let's see. These are great questions. What about using, so this is back to the formula. So if you had to use formula, what about some of these low hypoallergenic, maybe progestamil pre-digested types of feedings? Have you seen in your experience, any babies not tolerate? Feeding? I didn't read anything so far in the literature, to my knowledge, where they are using this type of formula. And like I said before, I don't have a digestion problem in these babies. So I'm not aware of anything in the literature speaking about using this in this population. Yeah. So Colleen's asking a great question. We're talking about therapeutic hypothermia. So it's the first three days of life. And so sometimes mom have very small volumes. And what if the mom's expressed volume is below your goal and 
would you just give as much as you can and then supplement with donor milk if you had it? And I guess back to formula, if you had that, or would you just do oral swabbing, oral immune therapy with what you have? How would you play with yeah, that? Th that's a great question. And this is a practical question also. If I have even a drop or two drops of this precious fluid, I would use it as OIT and complete with donor human milk. So use I the have mom's supply. milk as oral. Yeah. And then give the, yeah. the feed in the nutrition as a donor, donor milk. milk. Excellent. Excellent. Love is asking, how does feeding go hand in hand with sedation during cooling? Are there any dynamics or any contraindications or precautions that you would give to people? That's a good question too, Kathy. But we know that we are using very low doses of sedation. So we don't use very high doses that may affect the motility of the intestines. So we rarely have problems with this and it shouldn't affect. Excellent. Oh my gosh, I see 13 more new messages below. Are there any hard contraindications to feeding babies on cooling? I think I'm a little bit perhaps biased, but I don't think there is contraindication to feed unless the baby is really sick and I have a DIC picture or very low or hypotensive or in shock. This is another story, but yeah. the majority of them are not like this. So the unstable babies, you don't feed. Yeah. Basically. Okay, I'm hopping over into the Q&A area. So keep the questions coming to Q&A or to the chat. I'll keep looking for them. Okay, so the number first one is, what did you do in your study? Did you keep the infants at 10 per day for the whole 72 hours? And then once rewarmed, start increasing? Can you talk about your progression from cooling to rewarming and beyond? Yes, Kathy. So we were keeping them at 10 ml per kg per day, which is the minimal enteral feeding during the cooling period. Then after rewarming, we're increasing quite quickly to reach full feeding. Excellent. So can you describe what quickly means? So quickly is as the baby is tolerating. So it may be 30, 40 ml per kg per day increment. Excellent. And remembering these are term babies, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't stop a baby who wants to suck and swallow, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Someone's asking, I noticed it's still quite a delay in the fed group until the medium time of first feeds. So any reasons as to why? So how do you make that decision to start the feedings? Are they speaking about the, our table, our study? I think so. So I can put it and we can see it together. So they were just saying, you know, it seems still pretty late, yes. the median. And then, so what limits you from starting earlier? Because even the first feed or the lowest in this quartile is the 33. So yes, correct. This is a very good question and a good point. I want you to remember that this was in 2018. Mm -hmm. so our current protocol is faster than this. And I do completely agree that the median of 63 is long. So currently, I think our new data would be far less than this because we are starting most likely in the first day or the second day, the feeding. So those numbers would have changed, but nice to notice this. Yeah. Yeah. Very observant. So at this point, just run us through what your practice would be. So you get the baby admitted, you decide that they're eligible for cooling, you get them on the cooling blanket, we do all the normal admission. At what point in rounding or conversations at the bedside do you begin to have that feeding conversation? So part, this is now part of the protocol. So this is something that is decided after starting the cooling. And like I told you, in the first 24 hours, this decision is made. So we don't have problem to, like I said, now those 63 hours, you wouldn't see them now. Yeah. So just encouraging mom to express, get them. Yeah. So there's a great it. work done by lactation to mm. help mothers to express. And we tell them that even if it is a drop to bring it and to give it to the baby. Excellent. Excellent. So what in your practice so far, what would be, do you know off the top of your head, what's the youngest or the youngest baby you fed on cooling? that happened 10 hours of life, 12 hours of life? Uh, yeah, it was around 12 hours. 
Wow. Yeah. That's, and I think that's where that clinical confidence comes from. You guys have been doing it, you've studied it. And I know, I think it's interesting to think about that cohort that you ended the data collection in 2018 and to hear we're 2022, four years later and how much has already drifted and shifted in so many units. But I, but this work is so important to just give other clinicians that confidence to, to try. So in addition to offering the enteral feedings, do you also provide the oral care? Like you mentioned, the oral immune therapy, is that part of your protocol? It is a routine. Yeah, it is a routine. That's your routine. And then the last question that I see, and if I've missed any, please just retype them. Do you have plans to run a randomized control trial in Canada or North America? <laughs> Where is this question coming from? So perhaps <laughs> we can <laughs> collaborate. <laughs> That would be great, but this would be a very huge project. And like I said, it should be multi-center. This study about the variation, I would recommend to, to read it if you are in Canada to see the differences between the centers, because we have small centers where they have perhaps four cases per year, but we have very big centers where they have 40, 45 cases per year. So you need a collaboration over the country to have a very good study. But... I would be more than happy to be part of it. Maybe the Newborn Brain Society or some other organized group can help us to organize this across, yeah. the, across the world. Obviously, this is a very important topic. And I love that you started with that gut brain access. And of course, at Synapse, we always care about the baby brain. And, and I love that feeding really is part of neuroprotection beyond just offering the therapeutic hypothermia, which is so important. But these little things, these variances that we see from unit to unit, this is where I think we can make that next step, that next level of improvement in care for these babies. Yes, completely agree, Kathy. Oh, so good. Let's see. Most data is about babies 35 weeks or more. We have had 35 weeks on cooling. Do you feed them too? So do you approach the baby in that 35 to 36 window differently than you do 36 and above? No, we have the same protocol for all of them. And I don't think we should have this difference because as I showed you in the beginning, after 35 weeks, we don't have problem with the GI tract as function. So it shouldn't be a problem. But if you have cases where babies are not tolerating, we'll go slower. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions? Yeah, so for those who are asking for the slides, I will provide the PDF so it can be shared with others. Great. Thank you for that. That's such a gift. And so please say thank you to Wissam when you have the chance, because it's a lot of work to put together these studies and these slides and to make them available is such a gift to all of us so that we can all do better for babies wherever we are. You are welcome. Just many people just saying thank you and great. I think that is all the questions. I, I think this is just a sign of you've made it so clear and obvious that if we're not cooling, we need to bring it back to our team and to discuss this literature and to be advocates for ongoing research in this area to start small with one, one little change and, and go from there. Great. Oh, thank you, Wissam, for being with us. We are so grateful and thanks to all of you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being just great participants. Have a great day whenever you're watching this recording. And anyways, we'll see you on the next presentation. Thank you again, Dr. Al Baraki. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks for the audience. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for being with us as part of this Caring During Cooling replay in honor of HIE Awareness Month, April 2023. Thank you again for being a part of our replay series. I hope that you will join us again next Monday for another replay, and we'll be talking about ventilating during cooling with Dr. Mohammed El Dib. So go ahead and post your comments and questions in the live chat below, as this will be staying up for I don't know how long for forever and ever now, but we would love to have the conversation. We'll be checking in on the comments and I really want to support you as you move forward with your journey and your unit's journey of caring for babies during cooling. If you need to still catch the slides, I will pop the QR code on at the end. And there is an option for nursing CEUs. If you want them, check out the link in the show notes. Anyways, see you next week, Monday. 
on April 17th for ventilating during cooling. And again, thanks for being part of our replay for HIE Awareness Month. Bye.